People are the most consequential and dangerous forces on Earth. Well, personality psychology is about the nature of human nature. It's about people. And wouldn't that be useful to know? I mean, it seems to me, I can't, I can't think of a more important problem. Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm Blake Lepp, PR manager at Hogan Assessments and co-host of the Science of Personality podcast. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today for the latest edition of the Science of Personality Live. For those of you who don't know, Hogan has a bi-weekly podcast called The Science of Personality, where we bring in guests who are leaders in their field to talk about personality and the various ways it impacts our lives. We're very excited to bring the latest installment live today with our topic, versatility, the key ingredient to effective leadership. We want today's session to be engaging and interactive, so we'd love to hear what questions you might have. Uh, there will be a Q&A session at the end of the discussion, so if you want to submit a question, please do so using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. It can, it can be a little difficult for us to keep track of all the questions coming in via the chat feature, so please be sure to use the Q&A function if you'd like to see your question answered. Lastly, we are recording today's discussion, and it will be, be made available on our YouTube page at youtube.com forward slash Hogan Assessments. If you're interested in viewing past webinars or to see what's coming up, you can visit our webinars page at hoganassessments.com forward slash webinars. So with that out of the way, let's get started with the brief introduction of today's presenters. First, I'd like to introduce my co-host on the Science of Personality podcast and Hogan Chief Science Officer, Dr. Ryan Sherman. As Hogan's Chief Science Officer, Ryan is responsible for managing the primary functions within Hogan's industry-leading data science team, including client research, product development and maintenance, and overseeing Hogan's research archive and infrastructure. Next, I'd like to introduce our guest, Rob Kaiser, president of Kaiser Leadership Solutions. Rob has devoted his career to assessing, selecting, and developing leaders who build better cultures and get better results. Throughout his career, Rob has created a suite of tools to help managers become the versatile leaders their organizations need including the patented Leadership Versatility Index 360, Progress Report Measure of Behavior Change and Impact, and the Integrated Personality Summary Distilling Results Across the Hogan Suite in a Compact Custom Narrative Interpretation. These days, when he's not coaching executives, assessing candidates for top jobs, or helping CEOs and CHROs upgrade their leadership culture, he trains coaches, executive educators, and talent professionals to use his tools. So, Rob, is there anything else you would like the audience to know about you before we dive in? I just I'm really delighted to be here and I wanted to thank you guys for inviting me back. It seems like it's been a global pandemic or so since our last <laughs> podcast. Uh, you know what, Blake, I, I do have one thing I'd like to ask the audience. I'd like you to, to think about what you believe is the one thing great leaders do more than anything else. No right or wrong answers. This is your professional opinion. More than anything else, what is that one thing that you believe great leaders do? I'd like you to jot that down. All right, next question. What's the opposite of that one thing? Go ahead and write that down too. We'll loop back to this a little bit later toward the end of the podcast. Well, Rob, we brought you on this special live edition of the podcast to talk about leadership versatility. Before we take a deeper dive into this topic, can you define leadership versatility for our audience? Sure. Uh, we define versatility simply as a leader's ability to read and respond to change with a wide repertoire of complementary skills, behaviors, and perspectives. Well, uh, first of all, I want to say thanks, Rob, for, for joining us uh, today. I also want to say thanks to our audience for, for joining us here as well. But yeah, that, that definition, Rob, the ability to read and respond to change with a wide repertoire of complementary skills, behaviors, and perspectives, I mean, that's a lot in one little short sentence. Uh, I feel like versatility, it feels like it's more than that. So maybe you could unpack that, that sort of shortened version for us. <laughs> yeah, sure. You know, the, the, the first part is pretty standard fare for definitions of flexible, agile, or adaptable leadership, right? Read and respond to change. 
Reed is the, is the cognitive sense making part where you, you know, the leader's scanning her environment, making sense of what's going on. Respond, of course, is the behavioral part that's taking action based on your interpretation. And change, of course, is the order of the day in organizational life. Things are constantly in flux. But it's that second part, the, the wide repertoire of complementary behaviors that, that makes versatility a unique idea. It's kind of like ambidexterity, only applied to leadership capabilities rather than hands. Can you show empathy and hold people accountable? Can you zoom out and see change in the strategic big picture and zoom in on the tactical details for how to capitalize on that opportunity? Well, uh, the thinking is sort of dovetailing off of that point about being am ambidextrous. I mean, I, I mean, I, I played baseball for a while. I throw with my right hand. I can maybe kind of throw things with my left hand, but it's pretty difficult. So, I mean, when you talk about versatility in terms of being ambidextrous, how hard is that? How hard is it for leaders to to achieve this? I think it's extraordinarily hard. I mean, leadership is hard. Because it involves a bunch of different behaviors, some of which may not come naturally to an individual. Some may, some may not. No one's born a complete leader. You got to learn all the leadership lessons. But even more than that, a lot of the requirements of leadership seem opposing or even paradoxical. Support people and hold them accountable, take charge and empower drive change and transformation and provide the stability and continuity it takes to execute, grow the business, focus scarce resources on the vital few priorities. There are tensions and trade-offs that make leadership an incredibly difficult balancing act. Well, <laughs> I, sorry, sorry, Rob, if you want to go ahead. You no, 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 please. Well, I was just going to say that I, I feel like um, you, you, that, that I guess that that seems that, that difficulty, right? Uh, it, it seems to stem from the sort of notions that there's a whole bunch of advice out there on leadership. This is one way to lead. That's one way to lead. Um, I know we'll probably talk about some of those today, but to what extent um, is 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 that what makes it so difficult? Is that there's advice out there that says lead this way, no lead that way, and sometimes those feel like they're opposites. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. That's right. I, I, I'd like to borrow the third law of thermodynamics. <laughs> For every truth about leadership, there's an equal and opposing truth about leadership. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'll say this, though, Ryan, um, there seems to be a growing trend now over the last decade or so. There's just been a proliferation of models that conceptualize leadership in terms of these paradoxical behaviors, right? I mean, you've got uh, Charles O'Reilly, Michael Tushman have popularized the idea of ambidextrous leadership. They define it as on the one hand, being able to explore new ways to create value. And on the other hand, how to exploit existing positions in the market. Um, and Zhang and her colleagues have been talking about uh, paradoxical people leadership, where they're combining a hierarchical top down with inclusive collaborative sorts of behaviors. It seems that every month or so I see a new heart article in Harvard Business Review with a variation on this theme. Well, so I guess this really is a very different way of thinking about leadership, right? Instead of um, you know, just do more of this thing or be more like that person or, hey, this was my life. This is how to be a leader because I was great. So just follow my examples and you'll be great. This really sounds like a very different way of thinking about leadership. Well, I think it is. It's, it's less about, you know, imitating your idols and it's more about considering what functions leadership play. What do organizations need from leaders? And organizations are rife with paradoxical competing demands, conflicting priorities. We want business results. We want to engage and attract people. Uh, we want to run a smooth, well-oiled machine that's efficient. We want to adapt to external change and capitalize on innovations that are out there. There, there are all these tensions and trade-offs at work. And we started with what, what do leaders need to do to make their organizations go and draw back from that into, okay, what behaviors does this mean our leaders need to be able to demonstrate to be able to run the organization? Well, Rob, can you tell us about how you measure and assess for versatility for both feedback and development for executives, as well as your program of research. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so we, we measure versatility with uh, the 360 method, right? Getting circle, uh, getting input from the full circle of stakeholders, comparing that self ratings. It's a tool called the Leadership Versatility Index, or LVI. And it's based on two really simple concepts that can take you into pretty complex places. Uh, first, think yin and yang. This is a design principle we use for our behavioral model of leadership. So yin and yang, right? Complementary forces that balance each other. At a high level, we, we talk about the interpersonal how and the organizational what of leadership, right? How and what are complementary. Now, we define how you lead in terms of another pair of yin yang behaviors we call forceful and enabling. Forceful leadership is about leading off of your own personal and position power to take charge, make the tough calls, and demand high performance. Well, the yin to the yang is enabling, and that's all about involving others and bringing out their best by empowering them, including them in decisions, and providing support and encouragement for them. The organizational want we define with strategic and operational categories of behavior. Strategic's all about positioning the organization to be competitive in the long run by setting directions, looking to grow the business and expand capabilities and supporting innovation to stay fresh and relevant. And its partner on the other side is operational leadership. This is all about focusing the organization on the day-to-day -day tactical details of implementation, driving execution, focusing scarce resources on the vital few, and managing with process discipline to establish a sense of order and predictability and stability. So that's the behavioral model, the yin yang behaviors. And we have coworkers rate those behaviors using the Goldilocks principle, right? Too hot, too cold, just right. We applied Goldilocks to a new rating scale that allows coworkers to rate behaviors on a continuum from degrees of too little to degrees of too much with the optimal score, the right amount, smack dab in the middle. Now, when you measure the yin yang behaviors with the Goldilocks scale, leaders are able to see where they've got the balance right or or out of balance with too much of some behaviors and too little of complementary behaviors. It's very helpful to, to target development to those things that are out of whack, frankly. Now, we, we use some fancy math, some geometry and arithmetic to combine the Goldilocks ratings on the yin yang behaviors to produce a versatility score. The more behaviors rated as in balance, both just right, the higher the versatility score. The more some behaviors are rated too much, others too little, the lower the versatility score. Well, Rob, I think that's one of the things that really makes the LVI pretty unique is that Goldilocks rating scale. Uh, there's you know, a, a lot of 360s out there. There's a lot of measurements for anything out there. And most measurement principles say, well, you know, higher, typically higher is better and lower is worse. I think when you think about 360 kind of context, um, you know, a lot of times if you, if I'm involved in a 360 and I'm rating somebody in a 360, or if I'm doing a reference for a colleague and I like the person, I think they're really good. I'm just going to go rate high, 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 high. They're, they're going to get high ratings across the board. How does this rating scale sort of maybe combat that tendency to, um, to want to do that? And, and, and how does it really make it different, um, from a development standpoint? Great questions. Um, for, first off, I can tell you, it, it, it does overcome some of those problems with what you're describing, which is commonly known as halo air, right? Everything high or the halo horns effect, everything low, that sort of thing. We, we don't see that in the LVI data. There's not one general factor where if you're rated high on this, you're rated high on that. And it is a different kind of scale. I mean, Ryan, when, when execs fill this questionnaire out on a colleague, oftentimes they'll comment that it required them to think differently. It, it seems to nudge a, a, a mind shift away from the more is better fallacy, you know, where higher scores are better score sort of thing. And, and I'll say this too, it, it captures the imagination of execs receiving feedback. They recognize the tensions and trade-offs that make their job a balancing act. And they often comment how much richer this feedback experience is compared to what they've experienced in the past. Sure. 
a lot of behaviors on most feedback reports are rated pretty close to tolerance with the right amount. But it's those ones that stand out too much, too little, and especially when you see the yin yang kind of complementarity of those, that seems to grab executives' attention and focus well, on development efforts. Yeah, and, and I think on that, that that part about the development, Rob, I think that's one of the things that, that's also really unique is that, and I, I remember very explicitly for whatever the example from many years ago you shared with me, which is an, an item about um, having a pulse on the finger of the day to day activities and that. You know, if you rate that a five on a one to five rating scale, that might seem like a very, very good result. Like, yes, this person really knows what's going on, but that also might be reflective of micromanagement and sort of doing that too much. And you can't really tell with a traditional sort of rating scale, but in your rating scale, you can tell exactly if they're doing that too much. Do you care to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, th thanks for bringing that, that up, Ryan. Um, you know, we did a bunch of lab studies to try to figure out how does this scale work differently than the typical five-point scale. One of my favorite studies, we had, uh, we had people rate their boss twice on the exact same set of behaviors, once at the five-point scale, once with the Goldilocks scale. And then we cross-tabulated, you know, how often was a behavior rated one, two, three, four, five, and also rated too little, the right amount, or too much, right? Here's the interesting thing we found in that study. About a third of fives were also rated too much. A real confound here, right? And these yeah, five-point okay. scales, they, they confuse doing a lot of something with enough already. And this is this is really troublesome because we know that a leading cause of executive derailment is when strengths become weaknesses through overuse. So the Goldilocks score scale gives coworkers a, a way to tell leaders when they've crossed that line. Well, Rob, let's get a little bit deeper into the research side of things. So in March of this year, you, Ryan, and Dr. Robert Hogan, our founder, authored a Harvard Business Review article titled, It Takes Versatility to Lead in a Volatile World. This came on the heels of a series of studies conducted since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. So what were some of the key findings from these studies? Yeah, thanks for asking. I didn't have a lot to do in 2020, so I was really glad we could, we could work on these research projects. Um, so the, the, the first study, Blake, it compared the impact of versatile leadership during the initial outbreak of COVID. So we're talking data collected April through June of 2020. Right. And we compared that to its impact just the year prior in 2019. Now, our hypothesis was that versatility would be even more important during the pandemonium of the unprecedented global pandemic. Think back three years ago. It was a crazy time, right? I mean, so many routines of daily life and work were completely upended and nobody had a playbook. So our research design used match samples. So we had leaders from the same organizations pre-pandemic during outbreak. They were in comparable roles in terms of level and functions with similar demographics, age and gender, tenure, management experience. So we were able to control for those things and rule them out as an alternative explanation and allowed us to, to really isolate the effects of versatility. So when we compared the correlations between versatile leadership and a range of outcomes, employee engagement, team agility, business unit productivity, and overall effectiveness, here's what we found. First, the correlations were significant and strong in both samples, but significantly higher in the outbreak sample. For instance, versatility accounted for about 50% of overall effectiveness pre-pandemic, but 62% during that outbreak. So what we see here is that versatile leaders were even more effective at, at helping their people and teams to regroup, refocus, and continue to get stuff done, even in those extraordinarily chaotic days. Now, those correlations also mean that on the other hand, those leaders who lacked versatility were overwhelmed and their teams struggled mightily. 
Well, I mean, obviously that's a really uh, powerful and impactful uh, finding that the versatility seems to be more uh, important and more critical in this sort of more volatile, more unpredictable kinds of circumstances. But I sort of wonder, you know, that that's comparing what happened before the pandemic to sort of right immediately in the pandemic. How did things play out over time? I mean, how do things look, for example, today or, or even in last year, sort of towards the tail end of the pandemic? Uh, great question, uh, Ryan. I actually presented some data on this a few months ago. Basically, we see that the increased effects of versatility seem to persist through that first year of COVID. I mean, remember, summer of 2020 saw a lot of upheaval, not just the pandemic, but social unrest and protests that polarize people major changes in how we organize and work and the rush to work from home. Big shifts in employee expectations and attitudes too, right? Great resignation, great reawakening, quiet quitting and all that. However, from, from April 21 through the fall of 22, we did see the correlations ease up a bit and level off. Not quite as high as during the first you know, outbreak of the pandemic or the first year, but still higher than it was than in the before times. And I, I think this reflects how organizations, leaders, and employees began to adjust to a new normal, at least with fewer, less intense disruptions and settling into some new routines and patterns, at least compared to the craziness of 2020. Yeah, so I, again, Rob, I think this sort of points to this notion that, you know, the more VUCA, sort of to use that term, and the environment is, um, the more important versatility is. And, and you know, I, I think back to, you know, some of these ideas that we're talking about here in terms of versatility that, you know, they have a long history. I mean, I think we'll probably later on, we'll talk about some of the origins of, of, of versatility in, in, in human history. But I also think about human history a lot. And, you know, I think about the human evolutionary environment and, and this sort of, uh, you know, we're, we're in, in an African savanna and we're in a small group and there's another group over there. And, and if they don't like us, they might come over here and kill us, eat us. Um, but that seems pretty volatile and unpredictable as well. So I wonder, you know, has has um, versatility? Do you think it's always been in a critical component, or do you think it's just continuing to get become more and more critical over time? Well, I, I definitely think that versatility has always been a part of group or tribe success or corporate success, for that matter. You know, uh, when we look back at the anthropological research on modern hunter gatherer tribes, our best exam model or prototype of what life might have been like as we evolved on a hostile African savanna. What, what you see is, is leadership is not a position. It's not an individual. It's kind of distributed, right? The best fighter leads the hunt. The fiercest warrior leads the battle. Person with the broadest moral perspective resolves the disputes in all of that. And those tribes that had wise people, great hunters, great warriors. Uh, hey, they're our ancestors. We're here today because we come from them. But something happened and, you know, let's fast forward many millennia. Leadership is institutionalized now. An individual is in that headship role. Now, instead of being able to distribute all these capabilities, it comes down to Mr. or Mrs. Leader having to play those different functions. And that's that's a tall order. So, so what about just the last 25 years then? What, what can we say about, <laughs> about the impact of versatility over this much shorter period? <laughs> well, I've only got data going back about 25 years. So that's all Perfect. <laughs> with certainty too. Um, but, but it was really interesting, you know, we have been at this uh, for a while. When we started studying versatility in the late 90s, it accounted for a little over a third of what it meant to be an effective executive strong enough to get published. And then it really took off around 2008, right? The global financial crisis, the explosion of the digital revolution, where we saw it jump up to account for about half of what it means to be an effective executive. Of course, then with the outbreak in the first year of COVID, almost two thirds, and it's recently settled in around 55%, kind of in between those two. Now I step back and look over those 25 years, I've been doing this work. And it seems to me that the accelerating pace of change and the more uncertain, ambiguous and complex the world has gotten, well, 
the more versatile leadership seems to separate those organizations that can adapt and thrive from those who struggle to keep up or the ones who fall behind. Well, you know, Rob, in the HBR article that, that you, Ryan, Dr. Hogan authored, you outlined four types of leaders and what their respective personality profiles look like. However, there doesn't seem to be a, a personality profile that can predict the, the balanced combination of these behaviors that define a versatile leader. So can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. First, let's take the, the four leadership styles uh, that personality is highly predictive of. Um, think of two by two. Is, is the leader more forceful or enabling? Is the leader more strategic or operational? Right, so you get four types, forceful operators, forceful strategists, enabling strategists, and enabling operators. And they each have a distinct personality profile, pretty much as you would expect. Like for instance, higher ambition is associated with more forceful behavior. Higher interpersonal sensitivity is associated with enabling. Inquisitive with strategic prudence with operational and, and and the higher the personality score the more likely the leader is to overdo the associated behavior and the correlations are pretty strong i, I remember when uh, bob hogan first looked at some of the work joyce and i were doing over 10 15 years ago he's kind of looking at the correlations and he says well young kaiser it would appear that you're you know what you're measuring almost as well as we do <laughs> but here's the thing these correlations are strong and they show us that for the vast majority of leaders, who you are is indeed how you lead. Well, so, so Rob, I remember we got together about November or so of last year and we sat down and we, you know, we shared some data sets, combined some data sets and just, you know, for our audience to, to know this had, you know, there were several thousand leaders from companies that people all over the world would recognize um, that we have a Hogan assessment data. We've got this versatility data. And I remember my goal, you know, I'm a personality psychologist. My goal was to say, let's find the personality characteristics of that versatile leader. Let's really hone in on what, what, what does a versatile leader look like? What should a versatile leader do behaviorally? And as you said, we found really clear patterns uh, of, you know, people who are too ambitious were too forceful. People who are too inquisitive were too, or high on inquisitive were too strategic. And we could predict all kinds of ways that people sort of went wrong in terms of leadership. But we had a real difficult time. I remember you know, in the morning we did this analysis and then and I, and I left, we went to lunch and I was sitting here sort of distraught, like we, we couldn't really find a profile for the versatile leader, the, this small minority group of leaders. And so I, 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 you know, I guess, you know, that's sort of the, the ultimate question is then what does this really mean? And, and I mean, we came to an answer eventually, and, and it was sort of this light bulb moment that you brought to me at lunch that it means that um, lots of people can be versatile. Or there's lots of ways to be versatile, but, but so what, what does that really mean for the small group of leaders, the small minority of leaders who, who are versatile? Oh gosh, you know, I was thinking back to that, to that, that November trip, that little data jamboree we had. It, it, fine, Blake, I, I want to tell you too. I mean, I've been analyzing data for a long time. Ryan is a wizard at this stuff. We sit down with this cleaned up data set and he takes a couple minutes to write some code. And I'm saying, what are you doing? He says, well, we're going to write a machine learning program to do millions of analyses to figure out the personality traits of versatile leaders. He hits the button. He's like, all right, let's go get a drink. Uh, come back in five minutes and see what it says. Sure enough, we, we couldn't find much that differentiated the versatile leaders from everybody else. Now, first off, Ryan is right. This is a minority. Versatile leaders are very rare, just under 10% in our larger norm database of over 40,000 leaders. But when we examine this small pool of truly versatile leaders, first thing we notice is their personality profiles are all over the map. There are significant, albeit modest, correlations with learning approach and low recognition, which probably reflects humility. But there just isn't a definitive versatile, a versatile personality profile like there is for the non-versatile types. Now, here's what I want to point out, though. What the versatile leaders do have in common 
our career histories defined by what the, the late David Peterson calls the DNA of developmental experience, diversity, novelty, and adversity. The versatile leaders had a variety of jobs and work experiences that required learning new skills and behaviors that don't come naturally to them. They zigged and zagged across different functions or business units, even industries and organizations. They had more expat assignments. They took stretch assignments into high stakes, high visibility roles for which they weren't quite yet prepared. They worked for, with, and led a variety of people with different backgrounds and perspectives and demographics. They could also describe in vivid detail stiff challenges and setbacks, even failures. And their penchant for formal systematic learning combined with a little humility enabled them to accumulate hard-won lessons of experience with new skills and capabilities like leaders themselves, versatility is made, it is not born. And these diverse novel and adverse work experiences form a powerful crucible for developing versatility. You know, Rob, that's- yeah, well, I remember, oh. I'm Sorry, like, I was just gonna add one other thing there that I remember going to that lunch, Rob, and it's sort of depressed on our car ride over there thinking, oh boy, what are we gonna do with this? And, but, but I, I left after lunch feeling really empowered that this was actually a really empowering finding because what it meant is there's lots of ways to go wrong as a leader. There's lots of ways to overdo or, or to underdo something, but doing it just right is not only difficult, but it's also possible for lots of different people that there's no single profile or no single way to do it right. There are lots of ways to do it right. And doing it right requires knowing the ways that you tend to do it wrong, which again, to me was really empowering. It's kind of counterintuitive, but empowering nonetheless. I mean, look, you, you pointed out that great observation that, you know, we know from the meta-analyses that personality is a great predictor of leadership emergence yes. who rises to the top. But we look at that same literature and it's not as consistent at predicting who can build a team that can beat the competition. That's right. Which, which is pretty wild to think, because as you were as you were explaining that, Rob, I was thinking, OK, who are some of the people that I can think of in my in, in throughout my career that have been what I would consider versatile leaders? And you know, I can pinpoint a few different people, but I could also say that they all have pretty different personalities at the end of the day. So that's, it's, it's interesting to whenever you stack it up and start thinking of those in your, your life or you've encountered in your career. Um, but I, I digress. I'm, we'll get to move on to the next question right now. But uh, Rob, you refer to versatility as a meta competency. So what, I'm curious, why is that? <laughs> uh, well, first off, meta competency just sounds cooler. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but, but, you know, seriously, um, the first reason is because versatility is not just another run of the mill competency, like drives for results, strategic agility, command presence, developing talent and so forth. This is because it represents a balanced and well rounded pattern of competencies. So in that sense, it, it's a higher order concept built up from the pattern of first order competencies and skills. Now, we, we view it as a higher order capability that emerges when leaders develop competence with a wide array of specific skills and behaviors, and then learn how to appropriately balance the opposing and complementary ones, and cultivate the situational judgment to know when to use which behavior and to what degree. Now, figuring out how to combine the complementary competencies and behaviors is a major challenge. Part of what makes versatility this higher order, higher order emergent capability. When we analyze the leadership outcomes associated with forceful enabling strategic and operational behaviors in one equation, they statistically account for sizable differences in those outcomes. But when we add to the equation a variable that represents versatility, how well balanced leaders are on both forceful and enabling, on both strategic and operational, it enhances statistical prediction significantly. Basically, versatility is more than the sum of its parts. So we call it a meta competency. 
Yeah, I think the other thing that, that really stands out to me in terms of versatility being a meta competency, Rob, is, is, is like most competencies, right? We typically think of you, you want more, more of the competency uh, is better, right? Having, that, I mean, that's sort of what it means to, to, to have a competency versus say some personality characteristic. But the interesting thing is getting more of the competency isn't about doing more of one behavior. In fact, if anything, it's about doing less of some behaviors and more of others, right? It's, it's about this right combination of behaviors that actually generates more of this competency, which I think really makes it pretty unique in that, and that's right. For, for most competencies, it's just, you know, more of a one behavior, and then you'll be better on that competency. But for this one, that's not the case. That's exactly right. It's, you know, I go back to what we talked about earlier, a functional view of leadership. What does your team or organization need from your leaders? And it's about using the right tool at the right time to solve the right problem sort of thing. You know, I'll add one more thing along these lines about this meta competency idea. As leaders develop versatility, it facilitates the acquisition of new skills and competencies in kind of a virtuous cycle. As they expand their perspectives and their repertoires, it becomes easier to continue expanding them. Now, on the other hand, executives who build their careers around their innate talents and play into strengths, they have a narrower range and limited ability to expand it. When the game changes, they're at risk for finding themselves exquisitely fit for a world that no longer exists. Well, Rob, you said as leaders develop versatility. So that brings me to the million dollar question. How can leaders develop versatility? <laughs> well, well, look. <laughs> million dollars, huh? All right, pony up, Blake, here goes. <laughs> Actually, the, 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 the first thing to consider is that versatility is not an all or none sort of thing. It's on a continuum. And I am not convinced that every manager can become a truly versatile leader, but I firmly believe most can become a more versatile leader. They can advance along that continuum and increasing their versatility matters. For instance, we find that execs who get uh, LVI feedback work with a coach to create a development plan share their goals and plans with coworkers, and then get coaching to execute that plan, they typically do increase their versatility by about four to five percent. Uh, for the statisticians out there, that's a little north of a half standard deviation. Now, for leaders rated at the global norm on versatility at time one, that average increase at time two translates to moving their standing on outcomes like engagement, team agility, team productivity, and so forth, from around the 50th percentile to the 65th percentile. Now, compare that to organizations that spend millions of dollars on an engagement program and are over the moon to see an uptick of five percentile points year over year. Yeah, well, I think to, to me, the reason this, this sort of works and sort of makes sense, Rob, is because um, when we look at versatility, you know, just scores on versatility, and, and we look at what are the outcomes actually associated with versatility, we see leadership effectiveness as the correlation is like 0.88. I mean, it's really, really high. We look at team productivity, also it's like above 0.7. I may be mis misquoting some of these, but I know they're extremely high. We look at team engagement, also very high. So versatility is really so tightly linked to all of these performance outcomes that it sort of makes sense that just even small uh, increments in versatility can have a big impact on the bottom line. Exactly. It's one of those cases where a small change can have a disproportionate Im impact. Now, now, Blake, I realize I didn't uh, answer your question directly. How do you get more versatile as a leader? Uh, first thing I would say is that, you know, in my experience, there are different routes for different kinds of leaders. But three principles seem to apply to most, if not all. The first one is that versatility requires understanding how you are wired, which behaviors come naturally, and which ones do not. Of course, this understanding can be gained with a competent personality assessment. Now, it also helps to get feedback from coworkers regarding how your personality shows up and your behavior at work and affects them. 
And this is useful for calibrating what you are doing effectively and what you could do to be more effective by adding new skills and behaviors, or perhaps being more selective with those that you might tend to overdo. Now, second, with this self-understanding, becoming more versatile involves learning how to do what does not come naturally and learning how to prevent those strengths from becoming weaknesses through overuse. The best way to learn these lessons is through the DNA of developmental experience, diversity, novelty, and adversity in challenging job assignments, especially those that stretch you out of your comfort zone. You know, there's, there's, little, there's little learning in the comfort zone, and there's little comfort in the learning zone. <laughs> And it's like my granny told me when I have to college, um, it's not enough to go through the experience. The experience has to go through you. Uh, reflective, humble learners seem best able to extract these lessons of experience. Uh, the third thing I'd throw out there is um, becoming more versatile also often comes down to an evolution in your self-concept or your identity, the story you tell yourself about who you are. Well, well that, that's an interesting point, uh, Rob. You know, at Hogan, we talk a lot about reputation identity, and some of that you were talking about reputation and sort of learning about your reputation, understanding what your reputation is. But that last point, you're really talking about identity. So what are the sort of differences that we see uh, in terms of identities for versatile leaders versus the less versatile ones? Mm. Yeah, so the, the leaders who really lack versatility, they, they, they tend to define themselves in a, in a polarized way. Yeah, you know, I am a hard charger, not a soft pushover. I believe in power through people, not power over people. They, they, they over idealize the virtue and the way of leading that they identify with and at the same time distance themselves from that complementary side, which, by the way, they often portray in extreme derogatory terms, more of a caricature than the reality of that other side. But here's the thing, the side to turn away from, that's what becomes their blind side. On the other hand, those who do develop versatility seem to come to see themselves in a more nuanced, differentiated, and yet integrated way. I am a hard charger who believes in power through people sort of thing. They grasp the necessary interdependence of opposing ways of leading and can imagine doing both in a way that feels authentic and genuine. It's something they can feel good about. And this mindset shift frees them up to become a, a better, more expanded and capable version of themselves. Well, well, that brings me to my next question. I'm, I'm curious, how does that happen? I mean, can you give us an example? Well, a lot of it comes down to what, what my colleagues and I kind of jokingly call shock therapy. You kind of got to hold up the mirror <laughs> and shock folks with what they see. And it, it helped them to recognize this kind of set of bad attitudes about that other side and the over idealization of the identified side. I'll give you an example. So we were summing up the assessment results, preparing uh, to define goals and development plan for the super intense, really driven, very smart executive. He says to me, he says, look, Rob, I get that some people think I come on too strong. I mean, I admit to that. I was born this way. It's just who I am. Heck, even that little personality test pointed to sky high ambition and drive. And then he got kind of self-righteous. And he says, and I'm not willing to be untrue to myself just to pander to this feedback. So I'm like, well, let me get this straight. You're saying that if you were to stop interrupting people, instead give them space to speak their piece, and you listened attentively and really considered what they had to say, that somehow this would be disingenuous? It sounds like a simple lack of manners to me. Now, we, we had built a strong relationship and spoke pretty freely to each other. And after hearing me reflect back what I had heard, he kind of laughed and he said, all right, I get your point. I do sound kind of childish here, don't I? Well, well, Rob, I think there's a couple of points in there. One of those is that, um, you know, I think people might say, well, wait a minute, are you saying versatility? That's just all about being one person in one place, being another person in another place, sort of changing who we are all the time and not really having core values in, in a core self. And, and, and so I'll, I'll let you respond to that. But, but I also want to point out here that I think 
um, to some extent, what you're talking about is just sort of being more mature, being a, being a more mature uh, working adult. Well, that's, that, that's, that's a really good way to put it. Actually, I've been thinking of development as maturity for, for, for a long time. And what does that mean? Um, you know, it, it's interesting, Ryan. Um, most of the wisdom traditions around the world and over time seem to emphasize this ideal of integrating the opposites. You know, whether it's the Taoists with yin and yang, the Bhagavad Gita on the transition from Tamas to Rajas to Sattva, Aristotle and his golden mean, or even modern yoga instructors who preach balance. What, one of my favorites um, is the medicine wheel teachings of the Plains Indians of North America. It uses the, the four cardinal directions to delineate four great powers. To the north is the white buffalo of wisdom with its knowledge and experience. And to the south is its opposite, the green mouse of innocence with its purity and openness. To the west is the black bear of introspection looking inward. And to the east is the gold eagle of illumination for seeing far and wide. Now, uh, according to the, to the Plains Indians, each person is, is born within one of these four positions. A, a beginning place that defines their most natural way of being. But to become whole, each person must grow by seeking understanding in the other three directions. It's mastery of all four that is required to, to become complete and balanced in perception, thought, and action. I think the medicine wheel is a, is a really instructive metaphor parallel for, for leaders who seek the versatility needed to lead their people, teams, and organization through disruption, uncertainty, and whatever is lurking around the corner. Well, Rob, this has been a, a fantastic discussion, but I'm, I'm curious, before we, we get into the Q&A session, do you have any final comments? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. J just one thing, Blake. Um, let's return to how we open things up, right? I'd like to ask the audience to, uh, to consider what you jotted down at the top of the show. That one thing that you believe great leaders do more than anything else. And then the opposite of that. Now, I would be willing to wager that fewer than 10% of you wrote down two good things. That's what we find in workshops with thousands of managers. And it also happens to be about the base rate for truly versatile leaders who cultivate that both and mindset rather than either or. The key to becoming a, a versatile leader is the deeper work of, of, of keeping yourself honest, being fair and balanced, and seeing the world from this dual perspective, as, as my colleague Niels Henrik Sorensen puts it. So, my challenge to you is to, to redefine that opposite thing, but this time in terms of another good thing for leaders to do, the yin to the yang that balances that first one thing. Now you'll be thinking like a versatile leader. Well, thanks, Rob, and thank you, Ryan, for that awesome discussion. Uh, now let's take some questions from the audience, and it looks like we've already had several come through. So as a reminder, if you'd like to submit a question for our panelists, uh, please do so using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And so our first question, uh, this comes from Annie. So Rob, what implications does this have for succession planning and executive selection? Oh, excellent question, Annie. I, I think the implications are pretty straightforward. You want to bet on your learners and your folks who have had the diverse experiences, not just straight up the stovepipe. I mean, look, there might be certain roles where you want a certain proven commodity of expertise. You know, I'm thinking uh, an example, a turnaround artist who's three or four, five assignments in a row where they've been able to turn something around. Now, if you've got another turnaround, you could probably safely bet on that proven commodity. But given how VUCA the world is and how fast pace of change is speeding up the collision of these paradoxical needs and demands in organization. I would bet on the ones who have got the broader range of experience and the broader toolkit to adapt to whatever happens to flare up. Well, I, and I think that that is exactly a, a perfect point for when you get to that sort of critical moment for executive selection. But I think for taking a longer view of succession plan, I don't think Rob will disagree with me here. 
I think what you would want to encourage people to do is if people you, you're looking at as potential for leadership in the company is you would encourage them to get those kind of experiences, which crazy as it might sound, might even require you suggesting that they go work at another organization for some time with the potential to come back down the road in the future. I, I don't know what you think about that, Rob. I think it's crazy and out of the box, but that's we need to bend and stretch our managers early in their careers as they're coming up the ranks so that they have that wider outlook and that broader range of skills and behaviors it's going to take whenever you're at the top and the consequences matter most. You know, not to get, I mean, I think there's a lot of parallels there in like, let's say the coaching profession in, in athletics, you know, you know, somebody who might have an allegiance to a school, maybe they went to a certain school and they, and they begin coaching at that school after the career. A lot of times they're, they're asked to go away and come back um, because it's better to learn things at another place and bring those new things back. So um, you see that a lot in athletics and anybody who listens to our podcast knew we were going to get our sports plug in today. So there you go. Uh, next question comes from Alan. Um, so is there an immunity to develop more versatility? Uh, some major assumptions we may not be aware of that are holding us back from increasing our versatility? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at the individual level, absolutely. You know, what, what I find pretty regularly, not every time, but more often you might guess, is that when we really poke and prod and get under the hood between some extreme behaviors and leaders, either way overdoing it or way neglecting and underdoing it, when you poke and prod, you oftentimes find that there's something that looks vaguely like a fear associated with that extreme behavior, right? It's fight or flight. Overdoing is kind of a parallel to fight, underdoing flight, that sort of thing. But when you really get down to it, this is where this idea of identity comes in. I am this kind of person. I'm not that kind of person. And these fears that if I behave in this way, something really bad's going to happen can can really hold leaders back from stepping out of their comfort zone. Now, that's that's where things like coaching can be really, really helpful. Get out of your head and into a conversation. There's something about, you know, getting the boogie boogeyman out of your mind and on the table. <laughs> You can be a little more objective about it. And, and, and in that sense, less that the fear has you, then you have the fear. And you can you can run some simple tests and experiments. What's the worst that could happen if I did more of this or less of that? Well, let's find some safe experiments we can run and see what happens. Well, well, Rob, sort of on that front, you got me thinking as sort of a follow-up to that. I mean, what, what do you have any thoughts on the value of sort of simulations for doing those kinds of things? Because that may be the thing. You may go, well, I might like to try this, but boy, trying it in a real situation makes me feel very uncomfortable. But if I could try it in a situation where I know it's a little bit of a safer environment where, where maybe that won't, I, I don't know if you do this with any of your clients where you actually simulate discussions or, or um, tasks with them to, to help them develop those skills. <laughs> I, I think there's a lot of promise to that. I mean, the stakes are much lower, but we we, we kind of know from these high fidelity sims that people get really engaged and take them serious. So the learning is going to stick. Uh, true story, about six, seven years ago, a, a, a Danish partner of ours um, had approached me about developing some gamified simulations around this whole concept. I was really excited. Uh, long story short, a lot of money and a few years later, <laughs> became the sinkhole and we, we, we cut the cord uh, for inability to really execute on the concept. But I think the idea is right. And it looks like we have time for one more question. So uh, this one comes from Munir and sorry if I mispronounced that, but I did my best. Uh, can a versatile leader be seen as disingenuous, especially in a very competitive environment such as the military? Ah. Hadn't thought about the contextual part. Well, I, I would say this first off, I, I, I don't think so, so much given the way we're defining and measuring versatility, right? This isn't a chameleon like change my, my colors to adapt to whatever the opinion in the room is. Remember, you can only get to versatility to the extent your coworkers see you doing the right amount of these different conflicting behaviors. So almost by definition that they see you as pretty effective in that sense. I, and I would I would say this, um, you know, behavior can change. Uh, personality, that's another question. If you're curious, check out the Other Science Personality podcast on the topic. 
But even more than that, your core values, your fundamental principles, the things you stand for, to the extent that those are reflected in the way you lead and what you're pursuing, you might use a different tool or behavior as different means to that end. And the consistency of that end, I think, is what your followers and, and other stakeholders are really attending to. Well, I just want to say thanks so much to Rob for, for joining us on, on today's live podcast. Uh, and thanks, of course, to our entire audience for joining us today. Uh, it's always fun to have you here, Rob. And this was a really interesting and, and, and engaging discussion. Likewise, I had a ball. Thanks. Thanks a bunch for having me. Well, we want to thank all of you for joining the latest edition of the Science of Personality Live. And also thanks again to Rob and Ryan for the excellent commentary. We love to connect with you on our social media channels. So you can follow Hogan Assessments on LinkedIn, Twitter, or Facebook to stay up to date with all the exciting things that we're doing. Also, if you're not already one of our loyal listeners of the Science of Personality podcast, be sure to check out our full library of episodes at thescienceofpersonality.com and be on the lookout for a new episode every other Tuesday. Cheers, everybody.